so it's called ancient Corinth, but it's like a modern place. <laughs> um, and so that was where people lived up until um, fairly recently, there had been an earthquake um, and a lot of the town got destroyed. So then people moved to new Corinth or Nea Corinthos, as you're saying, yes, absolutely. Uh, so if you were to visit today, there's both a modern Corinth and a ancient Corinth. Um, so it can be a little confusing, but it's good that you looked up the, <laughs> the difference so that you would know where to drive. <laughs> Excited. Uh, we're in Dallas, Texas in the United States. So for us, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for coming in so early. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how much background everyone has, but um, I will begin first with letting you all, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, as your teacher said, it is, um, it's four o'clock in the afternoon here. Uh, so I'm Skyping with you guys from Greece, um, from ancient Corinth in Greece. Um, and I am here because I am an archaeologist. Um, and I'm originally from New York. So I'm here specifically for my job right now. Um, but I'm an archaeologist and I study ancient Greece. Uh, so I work here at the Museum of Ancient Corinth. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what this ancient city was like um, and why it's so cool. Um, and then I'm going to show you a bit about what archaeologists do. Um, and so here in Corinth, uh, we still excavate every year. Um, we dig. Uh, so we, we still have a lot to learn about ancient Corinth. Uh, so I'm going to show you about a little bit about what it's like to be in the field and what it's like to work in the museum. Um, and so hopefully you'll have a better sense of how people learn about the ancient world. You know, how do we know all of this stuff that's in your textbook? <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you um, and show you um, a little bit about the area. Unfortunately, we, because of um, coronavirus and everything, we are not currently excavating. Um, so uh, some of the images are from last year. Um, but I'll still show you what it's like um, in some photos. So if I'm ever speaking and you don't see on the screen what I'm saying, just um, flag me down because I won't be able to see you. Head back here. All right. So now um, if, uh, Christine, if you would just let me know, everyone has a, an image of the temple on the screen. We are good to go. Good to go. Perfect. Okay. So like I said, we are heading over to this place called Ancient Corinth, um, and we're going to see what it's like to be an archaeologist here in Ancient Corinth. Uh, but before we do that, I always like to start with um, something um, with all of my visitors, um, because people really like to ask me um, about dinosaurs. <laughs> and they ask me if I dig up dinosaurs or fossils. And I have to clarify that there's actually a difference between uh, archaeology, what I do, and paleontology. So paleontologists are the ones who dig up dinosaurs and look for fossils. And these things tend to be millions, if not billions, of years old. But archaeology, uh, that has to do with people and culture and anything that people made and left behind. Um, so there is a slight difference between the two. Even though we both um, dig in the ground, we actually study two totally different things. Uh, so next time somebody maybe talks about archaeology when they're really talking about dinosaurs, um, you can correct them and say that there's actually a difference between what these two fields uh, examine. So uh, as I mentioned before, we are going to head over to the other side of the world. We're going to head over to Europe. Uh, maybe some of you have been here before on vacation. Um, specifically, we are going to the country of Greece here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and I'm sure you've seen a map of Greece before. Uh, you've probably heard of maybe the capital of Greece called Athens. Um, and Athens is located just about an hour away from Corinth, so we're not too far away. Um, and so here in ancient Corinth, so in the town of ancient Corinth, uh, this is where we have the archaeological site and the museum, um, and that's where I'm uh, zooming with you today from. Uh, so we're going to look at that a little bit more closely. But uh, I want you guys to think about uh, what we mean by an ancient city. So it's hard for us to imagine how big 
ancient cities used to be. Because when we visit them today, uh, we usually just maybe see a museum and maybe a couple of old ruined buildings. Um, but actually, these cities used to be huge. They used to take up a lot of space. So here in ancient Corinth, we are going to visit in just a moment, we're going to visit this center of the city right over here that I'm circling with the mouse. So this is kind of like the downtown area of Corinth. But really, this whole area on the map used to be ancient Corinth. And there were thousands of people and so many different buildings in this area. So there was a harbor all the way by the water. So people were traveling by sea and they were trading um, and they were constantly moving around the Mediterranean. Ancient Corinth had cemetery outside of its city walls. Um, so there was a special place to bury the dead. Inside the city, there were so many different types of buildings, whether they were houses or entertainment venues. Um, this one right here, this one's really cool because this one has not been excavated yet. Um, and this is the amphitheater. So maybe you guys have heard of gladiators before in the Roman period. Uh, so this is where the gladiators would fight um, in ancient Corinth. But if you were to visit ancient Corinth today, you would come to this center of the city. So the Roman Forum or the Greek Agora. So this kind of downtown area of Corinth is the one where we have the museum and the main archaeological site. So this red roof building right here, this is the museum. Uh, so this is where I go to work every day. And then all of this kind of gray area around here, uh, this is, these are the remains of the ancient city. Uh, so these used to once be tall standing buildings um, and they have been excavated or they've been dug up by archaeologists uh, over the last 124 years. That's how long archaeologists have been working here. Um, and we're going to take a look at some of the buildings in a little bit, um, but just to give you another view of what ancient Corinth looks like today, uh, you have a view right here. Um, and we're going to take a look at this very famous temple that's here on the bottom. You can see some of the columns standing. But I want you to notice that all around here, there are houses. Um, and I mentioned at the start that ancient Corinth, even though the name has the word ancient in it, um, it is still a place where people live and work today. Um, and actually, people have been living in ancient Corinth almost continuously for about eight thousand years. Um, so there's a lot of history, there's a lot of archaeology in one single place, um, and there's always a lot to learn um, every year when we excavate. And so archaeologists have been studying ancient Corinth, like I said, for over a hundred years, um, and we're pretty sure that the ancient city used to look something like this. Uh, and so right now you should be seeing a 3D reconstruction of ancient Corinth. Um, and you can see that like your typical Greek city, there was a fortification wall running around, so it protected uh, the city. And inside the fortification wall, that's where people lived and worked. Uh, that's where they had theaters and stadiums and marketplaces. Um, and various parts of this city um, have been excavated over the years. Now, one of the most famous monuments, um, and one that is still partially standing today, is this Temple of Apollo. Um, and I'm sure if you were to visit today, you would take a photo at exactly this spot, as most tourists do. Um, now, some of you might be very interested in Greek mythology. Uh, so you might know that Apollo was one of the 12 Olympian gods. Uh, so we've heard of Zeus and Athena, um, and Poseidon. So Apollo was one of those guys. Um, and he was in charge of music and light and prophecy. Um, and here in ancient Corinth, they built this temple to him. Um, and we think that when the temple was built, uh, it looked a little something like this. Um, and so you should have a 3D reconstruction before you. Um, and this is sort of your standard Greek architecture. Um, maybe you've seen photos of the more famous Parthenon in Athens. Or maybe you guys have um, different public buildings in your own city that uh, look a little bit like this. Um, many of our government buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, have taken this architectural form 
Um, so it's sort of a very widespread uh, type of architecture that originated here in ancient Greece. Um, one other really cool uh, monument here in Corinth is the theater. Um, now, I'm sure many of you guys, for fun, you might go to the movies, you might see a play. Uh, well, people in ancient Corinth uh, like to do that also. Um, they love to watch comedies or dramas being performed. Um, and when archaeologists excavated the theater, um, this is how it looks today. Uh, unfortunately, not much has been preserved, right? It doesn't really look like a standing structure. Um, but we've studied the remains. Uh, and we think that when it was built, the theater might have looked something like this. Um, and so you should be seeing before you right now a 3D reconstruction of the ancient theater. Um, and you can see that it was a very large structure. So there was room for thousands of people. Um, and it was very nicely decorated with sculpture and wall paintings. Um, and it was generally a very important place for people to come together um, in the city. Now, one final monument I want to show you, um, which is a little different than maybe something you've seen before, is this place called Pyrene Fountain. Uh, now, Pyrene Fountain was another important place where people came together because it was a fountain house where people would come and collect water. So houses in ancient Greece didn't have running water the way that you have today in your kitchen. Um, and so people had to carry it around, kind of the way that you would your water bottle today. Uh, so people would come here to Tyrene Fountain, um, and they would drop their water pitchers into one of these chambers and collect water. Um, and so Tyrene Fountain was the largest of these water houses. Um, and even though this is what it looks like today, we think that in antiquity, it probably looked something like this. Um, and so you can see a reconstruction of Pyrene Fountain uh, with these pools of water, fountains flowing. Um, it was very large, very nicely decorated. Uh, and something very exciting for archaeologists is that we do have some of this colored wall painting preserved. Uh, so we know that the inner chambers where people would drop their water jugs and get water, they were painted. Um, and some of them had decorations of fish. Um, so this is what it would have looked like if it was very clear. Um, so this is very exciting because usually color and different paints are not preserved um, after thousands of years, but we do have uh, some very clear depictions inside of Pyrene Fountain. Now Pyrene Fountain is also very important for the mythology of ancient Corinth. Um, and maybe some of you have heard of Pegasus before. Um, so Pegasus is this horse with wings, and you see him right over here. And usually Pegasus is associated with Hercules, um, and they are um, depicted going on a bunch of adventures together. But there is a myth here in Corinth that says that before Hercules ever got into the picture, Pegasus used to be a wild animal. And one day, Pegasus was drinking water at Pyrene Fountain. And there was a prince of Corinth, uh, his name was Bellerophon. And Bellerophon, with the help of the goddess Athena, was able to capture Pegasus and tame him. Uh, and then they, were, they went on all their adventures together, kind of the way that he did with Hercules. But basically, Pegasus sort of became like a symbol of Corinth. It became an emblem of Corinth. Um, and Pegasus was so important for Corinth that the people decided to put Pegasus on their money. So these three right here, these are three silver coins from um, Corinth. Um, and even though the coins don't say made in Corinth, the fact that they have a Pegasus on them is a clue for archaeologists that they were made in Corinth. Um, and so we find these coins all over the Greek world, all over the Mediterranean. Um, and we know that they originated in the city of ancient Corinth. Uh, now we mentioned Hercules, we mentioned Athena. Um, like I said before, here in Corinth, people worship the 12 gods of Olympus, like in other ancient Greek cities. So we do have statues of other gods, like Dionysus, the god of wine. 
uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And we also have another really cool god, and maybe you haven't heard of him before, uh, but he's this guy right over here, and his name is Asclepius. And Asclepius was very, very important in Corinth because he was like the doctor god of antiquity. So if you were sick or if you maybe broke your arm or your leg, you would ask Asclepius to help you get better. But you wouldn't just say a simple prayer to him or make an offering to him. You would do something very, very specific. And anyone asking Asclepius for help would make a clay replica of the body part that was hurting them and dedicate it to the god. So what we have here is we have over 900 clay body parts arms, legs, fingers, noses, ears, uh, you name it, there is a clay copy of it. And people would dedicate these to the god um, and ask for help. Uh, so it's a very cool way to see how people interacted directly with the gods um, and left something behind for archaeologists to later study. Now this right here is something that you might have seen before in a museum or maybe in your textbook. Uh, this is sort of your typical Greek vase, uh, Greek pottery, um, where we have these sort of orangey red uh, human figures against a black background. Um, and every museum around the world has some sort of uh, version of this type of pottery. Um, now what people don't know, or most people don't know, is that this type of pottery actually originated in Athens. Uh, so Athens was the city that produced this type of pottery. But here in Corinth, people started making pottery much earlier uh, than in Athens. Um, and even though it's not that well known, uh, it actually looks very, very different. So I want you to notice how different Corinthian pottery is from this uh, Athenian pottery. So these are a few uh, pieces of Corinthian pottery, and you can see almost immediately how different it looks. Uh, so for one thing, definitely the clay is a much lighter color, um, and people in Corinth, instead of human figures, they love to put in animals, whether they were wild animals or mythical creatures. Um, they typically tended to put animal zones, and they also love to fill their pottery with different designs, different flowers or circles, um, any sort of filling ornament. Um, and so we find this type of pottery all over Greece and all over the Mediterranean. Uh, and archaeologists are able to detect that it originated in Corinth. So we have to imagine that these ancient cities, people didn't just live inside of their city walls, but they were constantly moving and trading. Um, and leaving behind evidence uh, that they came through a certain place. So Corinth alone had a bunch of colonies in Greece and in Italy, here in Syracuse. But we also know that Corinthians were trading all across the Mediterranean. So we have Corinth here on the right, and we know that Corinth came into contact with people living all around the Mediterranean. And how exactly do archaeologists know this? Well, archaeologists working in Corinth have excavated several of these vases inside of a specific building called the Punic Amphora Building. And inside of the vases, they found this. And now I, I don't have you um, on the screen before me to ask you what you think this might be, but I want you to take a look um, and just think to yourself, what could this weird looking thing be? Uh, and you'll notice that it almost looks like scales. And these are actually preserved fish. So these are fish scales that have survived um, for about 2,500 years. And these aren't just any type of fish, but archeologists have learned that these fish came all the way from the Atlantic Ocean all the way here on the left. So people in Corinth were trading with Spain and Morocco and bringing fish from the Atlantic all the way to Corinth. Um, so it must have been a very um, 
specific type of fish that they really liked. Um, but it goes to show you how much people were moving around in the ancient world. Now we've looked at some pottery, we've looked at some statues, um, and like I said before, maybe you guys have seen some of this stuff before in museums. Um, and usually you see it sort of very clean and it's behind a glass case. Um, but all of this stuff at some point was underground. So how do we get from this to this? Well, that is where the archaeologist comes in. One of the important jobs that an archaeologist has is to excavate. And excavating is the process by which an archaeologist digs underground to find evidence uh, for human occupation. So we're looking for evidence of things left behind by ancient civilizations, whether they are buildings or whether they are artifacts, like these vases here. And we use this. Um, we use these artifacts to learn more about the ancient culture. So here in ancient Corinth, uh, I mentioned before that archaeologists have been digging for over 100 years. Um, and there's constantly something new to learn about ancient Corinth. Well, uh, in ancient Corinth, archaeologists work uh, for a couple of weeks out of the year, um, usually in the months of April, May, and June, we excavate. Um, and we don't just excavate anywhere we want, um, but we excavate in a specific place um, and we dig for a specific period of time. So the picture that you see before you, um, it doesn't really look like much, right? It kind of just looks like a dirt road. <laughs> well, this is actually what our excavations looked like on the very first day last year. So on day one of excavation season, the archaeologists came together, and this is the area that they started with. And over the course of several weeks, we slowly started to dig our way down and uncover what was underneath. And so in this view, you can see our team of workmen and archaeologists um, as they are digging. And you'll see that they're not just digging wherever they want. It's not just a matter of picking up a shovel and digging a hole, uh, but we have actually marked off the specific areas where people will, will be digging. Uh, and it's a very slow process of digging from the top and working our way down. And the idea is that the older stuff is deeper in the ground than the stuff that's lying on top, which is probably younger. So if we want to find artifacts that were used in ancient Greece, we have to dig pretty deep in order to get to them. But before we get to the objects, um, I want you to take a look at the tools that the people are using. So the tools that archaeologists use, we don't use any heavy machinery, uh, but we mostly use tools that you guys might have in your own garage. Uh, so we might use shovels or hand picks to dig up the soil. Uh, we put the soil into buckets and remove the bucket off site. Uh, we always use brushes to clean the surface. Uh, we want a clean surface before us to see what's going on. And most importantly is we take really good notes. We have to write down everything that we find, um, where we found it, in what condition it was in, because this is the, site, the type of stuff that will help archaeologists later when they are studying the objects in the museum. And up until fairly recently, all of this note taking was done by hand. Uh, so people would literally write out um, sort of like a journal for the day. Um, and before cameras were used, people would draw, me, draw pictures of all of the objects that they found. Uh, but nowadays we're lucky. Thankfully now we all have iPads. Um, and we're able to use an app called iDig, and this allows us to record all of the information directly into our tablets, um, and it saves us a lot of time uh, in the long run, so it keeps things really, really organized. So again, this is another view of the archaeologist, um, and they are digging in that same area that I showed you before. Um, look how far down they've come over the course of several weeks. Um, so here we have one workman who's shoveling, putting the dirt into buckets, 
Uh, the buckets will be removed off site using the wheelbarrow. And if you guys look closely here, you'll see that there's a box on the bottom. So this box is where we temporarily put artifacts um, that we find during the day. Um, and at the end of the day, we bring this box to the museum. And I'll show you later what we do with all of the artifacts. Now you might think that on any given day, archeologists find really, really cool stuff. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we do find gold jewelry. Uh, sometimes we find statues. Sometimes we find uh, painted uh, wall fragments. Uh, sometimes we find entire mosaics. Uh, so these are uh, special floor designs that are made of tiny, tiny little stones the size of your fingernail. And these are all things that have been found in ancient Corinth, uh, but they are sort of exceptions. Um, they're not found on a typical day. On a typical day, archaeologists find what you see before you. So most of what we find is broken pieces of pottery, like what you see right here. Sometimes we do find complete vessels, uh, but usually these vessels are broken uh, in pieces. Uh, sometimes we find pieces of glass, uh, so it might have been a glass plate or a cup. Uh, we often find bone fragments, so we know what people were eating and cooking. Uh, I mentioned the mosaic floor before, how it's made up of tiny stones. Well, this is one of them. Look how tiny that little stone is. So that stone at some point made up an entire floor. Uh, this dark stuff right here, this is not charcoal, as some people think. Uh, this is actually pieces of metal. And this guy right here, this is exactly what you think it is. This is indeed a fork. Uh, but it is not an ancient fork. It is an old fork. I'll give you that. Um, so we know it's old because it's very corroded, um, but it's not ancient. Um, and this goes to show you that archaeologists don't always only find ancient artifacts. Sometimes we find more modern artifacts. Um, and this tells us that we need to dig deeper in order to get to the ancient layers. Um, so we still keep everything, but we just, um, we just know that it, people in ancient Corinth didn't use this fork specifically. Uh, so here we have a shot of two workmen from a couple of years ago when they were digging inside of a tomb. Um, and inside the tomb, they found some broken pottery, uh, which you can see here after our conservators uh, cleaned and restored the fragments. And they also found this weird looking thing right over here. Now again, I don't have you guys in front of me to ask you what you think it is, um, but if you just take a look and think to yourself, what could this be? Um, and if you'll see, uh, this is actually kind of a yellow color. So this is a clue that the object is made of gold. And this is a gold hair spiral. Uh, so it might've looked a little something like this. Um, and now this gold hair spiral uh, this is a very delicate object, it's fairly small, um, and so archaeologists need to be very careful when they're digging. They can't be rushing, they can't be hacking away at the soil, because something like this could have very easily been broken or overlooked, um, and then we would have lost it forever. Uh, so archaeology um, is a very slow process, um, and we have to be very careful not to accidentally uh, break objects like this while we're digging. Now the gold hair spiral um, and anything else that we might find and put in the box, um, at the end of the day we bring it here to the museum. And so this is another look at the archaeological museum. And if you were to visit today, uh, you would see one of our many galleries with objects such as pottery, sculpture, mosaics, um, maybe you guys have seen galleries like this in other museums. But what you wouldn't have a chance to see are our storerooms. Um, and unfortunately, most of our objects are in storage because there's just physically not enough room to put everything on display. Uh, so we have storerooms for mostly pottery, um, pottery on shelves, pottery in drawers, um, and every single object uh, once it's excavated, it gets an ID number. And that ID number stays with the object forever. Um, and we have a database where we locate the catalog number with the location. 
uh, so we keep track of where everything is at all times. We also have storage for sculpture, like you see here on the left. We have storage for metal objects, uh, like hooks, uh, blades, um, anything made of metal is stored here. And we also have tens of thousands of coins. Uh, so you guys saw the three silver coins before with Pegasus on them. So those are just three of many thousands that we have from all different time periods. Um, and those are stored separately as well. And inside the museum, another place that you wouldn't have a chance to see would be our workroom. And this is where archaeologists spend most of their time. So the actual digging, uh, like I said before, it only takes up a few weeks out of the whole year. And the rest of the year, the archaeologists work here and they try to, uh, well, they study the artifacts. Um, and they try to answer some questions such as, when was this object made? What is it made of? What was it used for? What does it tell us about life in ancient Corinth? Because ultimately, archaeologists want to learn more about life in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, wherever they're working. And by studying these objects, we hope to learn more about life in the ancient world. Um, and we want to share our information with other archaeologists and with the rest of the world. Um, archaeologists also work closely with conservators. Uh, maybe some of you guys have heard of conservators before. Uh, they are uh, primarily responsible for taking care of objects as soon as they come to the museum. So they make sure that the objects aren't damaged um, and are sort of in, in good condition moving forward. And one of the things that they spend a lot of time on is gluing together pieces of broken pottery. So I mentioned before that a lot of what we find are broken pieces of pottery. We don't always find complete vessels. So one of the jobs that conservators have uh, has is to try, it's sort of like a big puzzle. So they try to glue back uh, these broken pieces in order to hopefully make a complete vessel again. Um, and they are also trained to clean um, different objects, whether they're made of metal, whether they're painted, whether they are organic, anything that comes out of the ground, uh, they are prepared to handle and to treat. Now, one final object I want to show you um, before we switch over to some questions uh, is this guy right over here. And I like to show it because it's sort of very different and maybe not something that you have seen before. Uh, so I want you to take a look at this object um, and notice that it's, it's not very big. I know this is in centimeters, but it's, it's a fairly small object. And if you look closely, you'll see that it's kind of a greenish color. So this is a clue. Uh, that this object is made of bronze. Uh, so it's a metal object and it's, it's not a crown, it is not a comb, uh, but I'll show you right now exactly what it is. It is a bronze eyelash. So what we have here is we have a marble statue. Uh, this might be of the goddess Athena. And the artist who made the statue wanted to make her look extra fancy, um, extra lifelike. And instead of just carving the eyes out of marble, the artist decided to put bronze eyelashes and eyeballs made of uh, bone and ivory. And we have examples of these uh, from other places in Greece, um, and they are found in museums around the world. Uh, so not all statues were purely white marble, uh, but they might have had extra eyes, lips, hair, noses in different metal and different materials in order to make them look lifelike. Now this bronze eyelash and any other object or monument that I showed you um, is available um, on our database. Uh, so like I mentioned before, archaeologists want to share all their information with the public. And so we have our database, um, which you guys can visit if you want, um, and you can look up different objects or monuments and learn more about them, um, because we like to share everything that we find uh, with other people. Uh, so it's something you can definitely check out um, 
on your computers uh, now that you're home. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm, that's the end of what I wanted to show you. So I'm going to switch back um, and uh, make sure, oops, where are we? No. There we go. Okay. Now, I think you can all still see me. Okay, great. So that is all I had about um, what we do here in ancient Corinth. If there are any questions or if something that makes sense, um, we, can, we can head into some questions. Uh, I guess I'll start just right now as they're possibly typing theirs in. Um, so how did you get to do what it is that you do? Sure, yeah. Um, so like I said, I'm originally from New York. So I, I went to college in, um, in the US and I studied archeology span in college. Um, and then I got my master's in archeology. span um, And so I was always really interested in, in archeology span and Greek mythology. Um, and then um, I moved here to Greece to work here at the museum. So this is a temporary job, um, but it's, um, you know, it's exactly what I want to be doing. So, so if somebody's interested in archaeology, you can definitely work in museums. You can go into the conservation route. Um, there's a lot of different uh, segues you can do. So, I'm I'm definitely on the museum side of things. <laughs> uh, Maria wants to know what are things that you have found or discovered. I'm sorry. What are things that I have found? Yes. Um, so, for me personally. Um, I guess the coolest thing that I found, um, I was digging at a site, um, a different city in Greece, as uh, was a couple of years ago, um, and I was digging um, kind of beneath a wall, um, and I could tell that there was something under the wall that wasn't a rock or anything, it was a different material, um, and it ended up being a sword. So I excavated a sword, it was about, where am I, about this big, it was an iron sword, um, so it didn't have the handle part because that was maybe made of wood or something that wasn't preserved, but the blade itself was preserved. So that was really cool. That is really cool. Ryan would like to know, how long did it take you to learn or study archaeology? Good question. Yeah, so it's, um, it's one of those fields that you never stop learning because you're always finding things. You always have to be on top of research. Um, you definitely need... Um, you know, if you go to college, it's usually four years. Um, if you go for your master's, it's two years. Um, a lot of people usually go for their PhD, so their doctorate in archaeology, um, and that could take six, seven, eight years, depending how long. Um, and then after your your actual schoolwork is done, you always have to be on top of the research, and you always have to be reading and learning um, because there's new studies going out every year. So reading, learning, always wanting to find out more if you like that. And puzzles, archaeology sounds like a good fit for you. Uh, Francesca would like to know, what job did you want to uh, do when you were a kid, maybe in fifth, sixth grade? <laughs> um, well, I, like I said, I always liked ancient history. I never really thought of it as a job. Um, but I, I, for a while, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a social studies teacher, I should say. So I guess maybe in that sense, um it, it kind of led to one another so one of the other jobs that i do here i, I do work in a museum um, but i also help run educational programs here so when students come to the museum i kind of do different programs with them so i, I guess i've done a little bit of both uh over time <laughs> that's cool though uh christopher would like to know have you found more gold or stone yeah so usually every excavation season we'll maybe find some gold uh, last year we found a gold ring uh, which was really exciting um stone yeah we definitely find stone objects whether it's uh stone tools or stone um pottery um that could be used for different things um but again the gold is it's kind of once in a while it's not every day that you find something out of the gold <laughs> And is this your only museum you've worked or have you traveled all over the world to different dig sites? Good question. So because I study specifically Greek archaeology, that's my um, specialty, 
I've mostly worked in Greece and a little bit in Italy. So I've excavated in different cities within Greece um, and also in Sicily. Um, and I've worked in museums in Greece and in uh, New York. Um, so for example, I worked at the Brooklyn Museum in New York because they also have some Greek and Roman uh, artifacts there. So depending on what your specialty in archaeology is, you'll, you'll travel to places that have that type of archaeology. And David wants to know how long have you been an archaeologist? Cool, yeah. So I, I guess I started in what year was that? We got 2010. So about, yeah, about 10 years or so. <laughs> Yeah, about 10 years. I do that too. What day, what year is it? Yeah. No. It was only a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> right. It does feel like that. Uh, a couple more just came through. Joe wants to know what is the oldest thing either you or your group has found? Mm, good. Yeah. So we, some of our oldest artifacts uh, date to the Neolithic period. And so the Neolithic period, um, uh, it would be maybe about 6500 BC or something like that um, and there are these some of them is pottery and some of them are they used to make these sort of like female figurines uh, so we have sort of an abstract female body um, and so those are some of our oldest artifacts here. Wow 6500 BC that's very very mm. long time ago guys wow. Yeah. Oh Francisco would like to know what's the most expensive thing or maybe the most valuable thing that you found. Mm. So it's hard to determine value with artifacts um, because, of course, we don't sell anything. Anything that we find um, belongs to the museum. It belongs to the country in which it's found. Um, so we never assign monetary values to anything. Um, of course, in, in our day and age, maybe something made of gold or something made of precious materials might seem like it's more valuable, uh, but that's only because it's less uh, frequently found. Um, there are lots of marble statues or uh, vases that are considered valuable, um, but it might be because of their design or where they were found or stuff like that. So it's a little tricky talking about value um, when we talk about ancient artifacts. Um, so it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, good because value can always have different, you know, meanings. And so it's mm -hmm. good to, to yeah. explain that with your explanation. Uh, Ms. Langston has a wonderful question that I hadn't thought of yet. How is it that you can tell how old something is? Good question. Yeah. And that's, um, it's, it's a, I can, you know, we can have a whole other hour conversation about dating. <laughs> Um, but essentially, there's two, two basic ways of dating, something called absolute dating and something called relative dating. So relative dating is kind of what we do on the field. So um, I mentioned before that it's very important for archaeologists to record where something is found and um, what it's found next to. Uh, and so this helps archaeologists figure out how old it is, because knowing where in the ground it was found um, and kind of what other objects were found around it um, will help us determine how old it is. Um, you can also think about um, TVs. So um, if you find a TV that maybe your parents had when they were young, it looks a lot different than TVs that we have today, right? Physically, they look different. Uh, so that's the same thing with ancient artifacts. The style, physically, artifacts change over time. And so because archaeologists are trained to look at these differences, um, we can learn how things change over time. And of course, with science, uh, with absolute dating, uh, we can use different scientific techniques to get more precise dates, so like carbon dating or gender chronology. Um, you might bring in these more sciencey dating techniques if you want to get more specific. Where is the museum again? So it is, so it's here in ancient Corinth. It's built directly on the site uh, of ancient Corinth. Um, so we, like I said, we're about an hour away from Athens. Um, and the museum was built in the 30s. So it's not, uh, you know, the state of the art museum. So unfortunately, we don't have too, too much space, but it, it's built directly on um, kind of the, the 
old part of, of, of ancient Corinth. Wonderful. Um, but you have my email. So if, if anyone obviously thinks of any questions later, feel free to, to email me. For sure. Yes. Again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for you this morning for us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what time is it there for you? Uh, so it is, um, it's almost 5 p.m. here. So I think we have, what, eight okay. hours? Yeah. Yeah, so we just yeah. started our day, and she is ending her work. Yeah, <laughs> wrapping it up. <laughs> uh, I guess one final question, and I'm going to cut them off after this. What has been your favorite thing that you have found? Oh, my favorite thing that we have found. Um, favorite thing. We, well, not that we've, at, this was excavated a couple of years ago from a different um, archaeologist, but we have these uh, beautiful um, fragments, uh, so pieces of uh, wall painting, um, and they were painted. Um, so I mentioned before that that's very, very rare for archaeologists to find paint preserved. Um, and so we have a lot of these preserved, um, and they're very beautiful, and they depict different gods and goddesses. Um, and so those are very nice. And they're currently actually, our conservators are working on them right now to try to um, get them in the best condition. So I think wall paintings are, are a really cool thing to study. For sure, definitely. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Yeah. And, and I look forward to reaching out to you in the future for Absolutely. Um, adventures. And um, again, you know, we just really want to thank you for taking your time. And no, my pleasure. And best of luck with the rest of your remote teaching and, and everyone stay safe and good luck with everything. <laughs> you as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.